Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome everybody. We have such a packed morning this morning. My name is Jackie Brunenberg and I'm one of the staff here at Panania Anglican Church. And I'll be leading us through the service today. Now, it's a big morning here today. Actually, it's been a really big weekend for us here at Panania. Yesterday, we celebrated the wedding of Nathan and Courtney from our evening service, uh, which was wonderful to see uh, people come together under Christ in, in um, marriage, which was lovely for us to celebrate. So there's probably a few people that are a little bit tired today due to being at that. Uh, today, we have the baptism of Archie Sartor. So a huge welcome to the Sartor, the Lily family, uh, and any friends and family that have joined us uh, to witness this great event uh, this morning. And I can see he's already smiling, so let's hope that that continues throughout the whole morning. Uh, but we also have a farewell today. It's also Paul and Julie's last week with us before they move on to Canberra. So we'll be including them in our service in a, a special way as well. So, with so many things happening this morning, let's get started. Let's all stand as we sing our first song. With all those wonderful things happening, isn't it great to be able to sing and praise the name of our Lord Jesus?
friends, please take a seat. My name is John. I'm the Senior Minister here at Panania Anglican and a special welcome if you're here for Archie's baptism. I believe some of our Sunday school last week were talking about baptism so they get to see what we do uh, and partly what we do is explain what this water is about. I actually have some water here, you can't actually see for our young people. But why do we sprinkle water on people when they become a member of God's family? Well, because Jesus told us to. And children, I hope you realise, are a good gift from God and parents are entrusted with raising them to know Jesus and to love him and to live for him. And so when they start on that journey with kids or when someone just becomes a Christian for the first time, we do what Jesus said, go into all the earth baptising people, making them disciples, teaching them everything that Jesus has said. And so that's why we do baptisms in church. We actually do them at the start of church because we know it's hard to wait. That's actually our theme this morning, waiting is hard. We'll learn a bit more about that from the book of Jeremiah late, later. But we do baptisms right at the start to get our young people at their best. So what the Bible says then is that this water is ordinary water that points to the extraordinary work of God in people's hearts, washing their sins from them because of the blood of Jesus which washes us from all unrighteousness. Jesus taught, in fact, that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. He said, flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. So we're going to pray uh, in a moment, uh, and we're going to pray that through our Lord Jesus Christ, he will grant to Archie what he can't have by his own nature, but what he can have because of the work of the Spirit, making him a living member of Christ's church. So let me pray for us, and you might like to join in with an amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your great love, you've called us to know you and to trust you. Will you increase this knowledge? Will you strengthen our faith and will you grant that Archie may be born again by the Holy Spirit, cleanse from all sin and inherit your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite uh, Tony and Liz and Archie and their godparents as well to come up the front because I'm going to ask them some questions about what they're promising to help Archie with. We trust that the promises of God include children. Children are not somehow outside of God's plans until they can speak for themselves. And so we uh, follow the, the Bible's own pattern of baptising within the household of those who trust Jesus. Fantastic. Now, in a moment, I have some formal questions for these guys, but I always like to ask what is this going to look like on the ground in, in homes? So, Liz, uh, you and I were talking about some of the things that you do in your household to help uh, all your kids get to know Jesus. Would you like to tell us some of those things? Oh, is it turned on? Look. There we go. All right. Um, some of the stuff that we do would be that every night we read to the kids from the Bible, from the kids' Bible, uh, and we also get the kids, we used to give them prayers to say, but now they're at the point of they pick something to say that they are thankful for to God, and they pick someone to pray for each night as well. Um, and another one is that me and the kids often just sing a lot at home or sing in the car, and I made a conscious decision a while ago to also change that to be some of the Christian songs that they either sing at the Christian preschool they go to, or some of the ones we do here at church, so they'll know them, or things like that what's, as what's well. What's their favourite, Liz? You wouldn't know it, because some of them oh, are from, right. their, yeah, <laughs> from Manuka, where they go to preschool. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah, although they love all the Colin Buchanan ones, like, oh, nice. you know, 10, 9, 8, who's the king of the jungle, those kind of things, so we right. do some of that as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Liz. Well, we, we have some more formal questions that, that just run through what would it mean to be a Christian? What are Christians convinced of? So I'm going to invite our whole group to respond. There is a microphone in the middle, but you'll need to use your uh, nice loud voices because our, our room is filled with witnesses who are hearing your promises and they're in turn committing to support you in living out those promises. So friends, we're at the bottom of that page. Are you yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, trusting the gracious promises of God? I am. And are you willing to sponsor Archie, answering for him now and accepting responsibility for his Christian upbringing in the life of the church? I am willing. And I ask you now to answer on behalf of Archie, do you turn to Christ? I turn, I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins? I, I repent, repent of my sins. sins. 
Do you reject selfish living and all that's false and unjust? I reject them all. Do you renounce Satan and all evil? I renounce all that is evil. Almighty God, deliver you from the powers of darkness and lead you into the light of Christ, to his everlasting kingdom. Amen. Well, Archie's been brought here for baptism. We're all now going to stand, I invite everyone to stand, and join us in declaring what is the faith we are baptising Archie into. We've got it on our paper, but I think we've got it up on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, I ask you then to answer on behalf of Archie, do you affirm this faith as yours? I do. I do. And will you follow Jesus faithfully, obeying his commands throughout your life? With, With God's, God's help, help, I intend, intend to do so. so. And do you ask for baptism for Archie into the faith you've affirmed? I do. I do. Let's pray. Merciful God, for Jesus' sake, grant that Archie, who we baptise in this water now, may be saved through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. May he die to sin and rise again to righteousness, and may your spirit live and work in him, that he might be yours forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, who died and rose again for us. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to grab Archie and show him the water again. Hey, Archie, we've got some water here, yeah. Well, Archie, look, we've got the water. Yeah, great. Okay, will you name this child? Archie Gary Sartor. Archie Gary Sartor, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I think Archie wanted to baptise me as well. <laughs> and Archie, I sign you with the sign of the cross to show that, that you are to be true to Christ crucified. Well done there, mate. I think I'm getting baptised for my second time. Uh, with the sign of the cross, to show that you'll be true to Christ crucified and that you are not to be ashamed to confess your faith in him. Uh, now, I'm going to say some responses with our, uh, the rest of our baptism party here. So I'm going to say at the top of that page, God has called you into his church... We Archie, we therefore receive and welcome you as a fellow member of the body of Christ, as a child of the same Heavenly Father, and as an inheritor with us of the Kingdom of God. Uh, and we're going to say the words from Fight Bravely. Fight bravely under his banner against sin, the world and the devil, and continue Christ's faithful soldier to <laughs> your life's end. Archie, God has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Shine as a light in the world to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Well done. Well, it's a bit hard to wait through all that. So why don't we give a round of applause to welcome Archie. And as we, we might just give a chance for a photo as Steph comes up. Steph's going to pray. Um, say the final prayers of our baptism as our children's minister. But if anyone would like to take a photo as well of the group just before I let them take their seats, we won't make the kids wait through the prayers. So we might just... Shall we just stand in a group and come this way and then we'll let our photographers take a quick shot and then Stephanie will pray. Yeah, see if we can get everyone. Microphone. Great. Thank you. Well behaved. Please. 
please do pray with me for uh, the parents and godparents uh, and all of us uh, in the church family as we uh, look to see Archie raised to know Christ. Gracious God, we thank you that through the death and resurrection of your son, you have brought us from death to life. Enable us by your spirit to resist the power of sin and give ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. May we not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we serve and please you in every way. And we pray for the parents and godparents of Archie. Give them the spirit of wisdom and love that they may teach Archie by word and example to fulfill the promises they have made in his name. In our homes, give us the joy that comes from being faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, it's a happy duty welcoming someone into a church family. It's also a bit bittersweet when we uh, send on friends who are moving to another place and we uh, have to say goodbye and yet we're also hopeful at what God might have in store for them. So we're saying farewell this morning to Paul and Julie Curtis uh, and they're such, such a, a big part of church life here, it's hard to work out how to do this well. So I'm going to ask Paul and Julie to come forward. They're very humble people, but I'm going to invite them to come forward because I just have a, a couple of words to say and a couple of gifts for us to give them. Thank you for tolerating me getting you up the front. Uh, and there is a microphone there, should, should you feel moved to, to say anything. <laughs> um, Friends, if you're here visiting, you won't have met these lovely people. Uh, Julie and Paul have been a big part of church life here for many years, uh, and in many ways. I think I would say the most important is just their Christian influence. As those who have served faithfully over many years and followed the Lord Jesus, you've rubbed off on us in many great ways, uh, just in conversation, uh, in your model of ministry. Uh, and I could rattle off all the different ways you guys have served, and I think there's a couple of them that people have been really impacted by that I must mention, but it's only a tiny selection. Julie is our SRE coordinator. It's just been a marvellous thing to have our scripture teachers uh, encouraged, organised, uh, helped in and supported in their various challenges, uh, and led from the front as you yourself have taught classes. So thank you so much. Uh, we will miss you greatly, uh, and you've, you've been a, an answer to our prayers as we're trying to reach kids in schools. Um, Paul, as well, um, I've appreciated you, not just uh, this year as you very kindly served as our parish council secretary uh, in taking minutes and organising everything. That has been such a personal blessing to me. Um, but also just being on parish council and sharing your wisdom uh, and your insights into church life and how we might organise this church to reach our community for Jesus and to build people up in him. So thank you to, for those things. But there are such, there's so many others we could mention. Um, I think after church, you're going to be swamped with people who would like to express their appreciation. Um, but the way we're going to do that from the front is, firstly, we've got some uh, flowers for you. Oh, you. If that's okay, I'll hand those to you, Julie. Uh, and we've got a, a book for your ongoing reading. Paul is an amazing reader, and he gathered our, our little evangelistic reading group uh, last term as well um, uh, to do reading a good book. So I know you'll appreciate uh, another good read. Um, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray for you, uh, and then, I, I hope you've been prepared for this, we have an item as well. We won't make you stand up for the item, but I'm going to pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, because of the communion of saints, we will not be separated, that even as Paul and Julie head off to Canberra, and we do pray you'll smooth their path and give them that joy of being closer to family, we pray at the same time we might continue to be with each other in spirit. Uh, that as we continue to meet here as a church family and they will be at a church in Canberra, that we might have that sense that we're, we're in Christ together. Uh, and so we have that joy and we look forward to uh, the future fellowship you have planned, whether here on earth or eventually in your timing in heaven, Lord. So we thank you that even at a, a physical parting today, we know we are still united. And we thank you for Paul and Julie and the many ways they've served us here. We pray you'll continue to raise up others to follow their good example. And we just thank you for the way they model Christ to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, will you permit us a round of applause? Yes, thank you. <laughs> if
If you would like a right of reply or a final word of encouragement, you're welcome to do so. And then I'm going to invite. And while you do that, I'm going to invite up some others. Um, yeah, it's difficult to know what to say. Although it's exciting to be moving on, it, we are sad to be leaving here. Mm. We've. Uh, um, it's been a, a place for us where there's been lots of great teaching, but also great fellowship. And um, I'm very thankful for the care that people. Uh, took a couple of years ago when I was sick and it was just amazing what people did and uh, it is a lovely family and we are really sad to be leaving and I thank God for every day that we've been here. Thank you. Thanks friends. We'll let you have a seat but we are going to have a, a little item as well. If you've been here long enough, you'll know that it's a bit of a Panania tradition for someone to write a song for those that are, who are leaving, if they've been here for a super long time. So uh, we're sad that you're leaving, but uh, we have this opportunity to sing you a song. Uh, and apologies um, from Kerry Newmark. She wanted to be here. She's written, is that right? She's written this for you. Well, I sort of wrote Oh, okay. All right. She wrote... It was a group effort, apparently. Um, uh, but yeah, she apologises that she couldn't be here in person to sing it. Uh, but yes, we're going to put the words up. This, it's Ode to Paul and Julie. If you know the tune to Ode to Joy, please try and sing along. Julie. Now, the kids have been very patient, um, and that is a bit of a theme today, but I'm going to ask all the kids to be upstanding, head to your programs. Your Kids Connection leaders will meet you in your rooms. Uh, big thank you to the kids for sitting through um, all those wonderful things. We are now going to have a chance to stretch our legs. Please stand as we sing our next song. In keeping with our theme of waiting uh, today, we are going to sing We Are Waiting, a uh, wonderful song. And in the chorus, it picks up that longing that Christians have for Jesus to come back and make all things right. Uh, so please join with us as we sing. <laughs> Yeah. 
as we pray. I'm going to pray on behalf of us all. Gracious Father God, thank you that we can come to you freely in praise and petition because of the sacrifice of your dear Son. We bow before you in the name of Jesus who died for our salvation. We praise you for your great power. You create all things according to your will and everything you create is most wonderfully made. We praise you for your wisdom, which is absolute and faultless. Help us to gain a better understanding of your desire for us to obtain wisdom through the study of your word, through listening, reading, and discussion. We confess that throughout this last week we have all fallen short of your glory and sinned in various ways in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds. If we have been impatient, uncharitable, or unloving, help us to change. 
we have failed to go to you when life is hard and problems arise, and we have tried to overcome in our limited wisdom. Father, please forgive us, as you have promised to do when we come to you in true repentance. Lord, you give us life and sustain it. Your precious gift of eternal life through Jesus is what we prize above all else. We look forward with eager anticipation and confidence to the day when Jesus returns and takes us into his kingdom. In this world, you freely give us good things to enjoy and provide us with everything we need for life. May we forever be grateful for your bounteous goodness towards us, your children. Help us to share what we have with those around us in whatever situation we encounter them. Guide us to those who need our help and inspire us with your love to love others. We pray for your guidance and help as we strive to grow your kingdom. Please keep us focused on you and on your word as we plan and execute our aims for PAC. We can't do it on our own, and sometimes it feels so hard, but you have said that you will always be with us, and you are as close as prayer when we have concerns. Thank you for faithful shepherds who care for us here and preach your word to us, for John, Brendan, Jackie, Stephanie, and Nigel. They are a blessing straight from you, and we are thankful more than we can sometimes express. Lord, it's relatively easy for us in Australia to worship and follow you, and we pray for all of our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted for their faith in different parts of the world. Please protect them and strengthen and encourage them in their faith. May they shine the light of your gospel into the lives of those around them and live as godly examples. We thank you for all those missionaries who are prepared to go into places which may be inhospitable at best and dangerous at worst to spread your saving word. Please guard and guide them in their endeavours. We pray for peace to prevail in this world which is broken by wars and disasters, both man-made and natural. Only you have the power to bring real peace which lasts and to change the hearts of those who should be shepherding their people but are serving their own desires. We weep for the devastation and loss being experienced by those caught up in the conflicts. Help us to be faithful in our prayers for all those who are suffering. We thank you for your inspiration in sending people to the war zones to help with food and medical aid. Today especially, we want to thank you for Paul and Julie Curtis who have been a gift to us all at PAC. We praise you that they have been diligent and faithful in service to you and to us. We thank them for their loving kindness, care and friendship to your people here. We pray that they will settle safely into their new home in Canberra to enjoy their children and grandchildren. And we know that they will be a blessing to whichever church they attend. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to stand and sing again. Um, it, a wonderful hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. As we wait in this world, we know that things are wonderful and challenging, and when we know Jesus, we can know that all is well with our soul. Please stand as we sing. Well 
The first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 to 14. It can be found on page 779 of your Pew Bible. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests. The prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after Kim, King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother 
the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisar, son of Shaphan, and to Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to the, all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because it is, if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where you, I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1, and I think it's page 1174 in the Bibles you have there. Starting from verse 1. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Waiting is hard, isn't it? Our kids did very well this morning. I was hoping they'd give me some kind of illustration of how hard waiting is, but they were just too well behaved. So let me tell you about a, a psychology experiment. You may know, I think we've mentioned it up the front before, called the marshmallow test. The marshmallow test is where you put a child in a room and the experimenter comes in and gives them a marshmallow. And then they say, I'm going out for five minutes. If that marshmallow is still here when I get back, you can have a second marshmallow. And some kids can wait, and some kids can't. Well, we've jumped ahead today to Jeremiah 29, and it's a letter. If you've got it open, verse 1, it's a letter from the prophet Jeremiah, and it's to help God's people wait. It's a letter sent, uh, let's see the map, from Jerusalem, from Jeremiah to the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And that's because there's now two communities of Jewish people in the book of Jeremiah. The first wave of exile has happened. The Babylonians came in and took with them, verse 1, most of Jerusalem's elite, the elders, priests, prophets, verse 2, the king, Jehoiachin, the queen mother, the court officials. It even says all the tradies and artists were taken off to Babylon as well. 
But Nebuchadnezzar left behind a bunch of people in the land as well, including Jeremiah. That's where he's writing from. So he's writing to the Jews in Babylon, the Jewish community there now who are exiles, and he's kind of prophesying by mail. This is him delivering a message from God, but via letter. And that's a long way to send a letter in those days. Babylon's about 1,500 k's from Jerusalem. And it seems, though, that the king was in regular contact with Nebuchadnezzar. Perhaps he was sending a tribute. And somehow Jeremiah slips in this letter to the exiles. So what's his message in the letter? Wait, wait. You guys have been sent in exile to Babylon. And there you're experiencing God's discipline. But... God's rescue is coming, so wait patiently. And that's hard, that's hard when you're not in the place you long to be. I remember uh, sitting in Nairobi airport for eight hours waiting for a flight once, uh, and I was on my way home to Australia. I had that Qantas ad in my head, I still call Australia home, uh, waiting to get back to my family, and I had to wait eight hours, and it was hard to wait. I was sitting there in the airport, back in those days, it burnt down later, but the Nairobi airport was a big circle and you just kind of walked around and eventually you came back to where you started. And so it was just kind of this, this endless waiting. Uh, in those days, there were only six shops in the airport as well. They just repeated them over and over again. And so I felt like I was kind of trapped for those eight hours, waiting, watching the clock. It's hard. It's hard to be at peace with exile especially if you're a Jew from Jerusalem, because Jerusalem, do you know what the name of the city means? City of peace. City of peace. How can you be at peace with living in Babylon? You might remember the, the words of Lamentations, uh, the words of Lamentations saying, we're in Babylon, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It's hard to be at peace when you're away. And that's relevant if you're a Christian person here today, especially, because you're waiting for a heavenly home. You're not there yet. You may long to be there. Perhaps there's some circumstance that you're just holding out for heaven. So how do you wait in that situation? We're going to talk about then two types of peace today, the type of peace you might have in your heavenly home, in your destination, when you finally get where you're waiting for. There's that kind of peace. But then there's the peace you can experience even now as you wait. That there's a kind of peace you can get that once you reconcile yourself to the fact that you're not there yet, but there's something to do now, you do start to experience a bit of peace here as well. We might call them the peace of Babylon and the peace of Jerusalem, or the peace of earth and the peace of heaven, the, the peace of away and the peace of home. Let's start with the, the away version of peace, verses 4 to 7. The letter starts in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, it's worth knowing that in chapter 28, which was skipped over, there was a prophet in Jerusalem who's been saying, God's going to bring these guys back within two years. God is going to defeat Nebuchadnezzar. They'll all be back in two years. So this kind of expectation has already found its way to Babylon, and so it must have been a shock when Jeremiah says, verse 5, no, build houses, settle down, plant trees, raise kids, raise grandkids. That's how long you're going to be there, not two years. Settle in for a long wait. If you've read your Bible, that might sound like the parable, do you remember the parable of uh, the talents, where the master entrusts some money to his servants and then goes for a long trip. And the question is, how will they wait? Will they, will they just sit around waiting for his return or will they do something with what he's invested with them? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard. If you thought it would be sooner, it's hard to orient your life to living instead of leaving. I've known a number of people in aged care, in late in life, who've just been waiting to go. They've said to me, John, I'm just, I'm just wishing the Lord would take me soon. I, I've, I've had, a, had a period of life where I felt I'm able to do things, but now I feel like there's nothing to do but go home. It's hard to make peace with having to hang around a bit longer, isn't it? 
And you don't have to be elderly or in aged care or at, in some late stage of life to feel that. Some of us might feel there's not much for us in this life. Maybe you know the words of Paul in the New Testament, I long to go and be with Jesus. Maybe life's fallen apart or family hasn't worked out or stress is just, sorry, work is just stress. And it doesn't seem I have much to offer the Lord in this life. Well, that's the, that's the temptation in verses 8 and 9 in our passage, because there are prophets in Babylon as well. There's prophets in Babylon, and they're saying, I had a dream. I had a dream. And their dream is the same as that prophet in Jerusalem. Our dream is that God will take us home soon. And they're saying, this is our message from the Lord. And Jeremiah is having to say, no, that is not what God is saying. God is saying, wait. That's not my plan. My plan is to settle in for the duration Remember Paul's words in prison to the Philippians, yes, it's better to die and be with the Lord, but he says for him, better to remain and keep caring for the people God's entrusted to him, for their joy and progress in the faith. Paul, of all people, languishing in prison, longs to depart, but says, no, it's better if I stay. There's fruitful labour yet. It's a hard thing to hear sometimes, isn't it? There's fruitful labour yet. I may not know what God is doing with me, but I know there's fruitful labour still. Some Christians check out. Some Christians check out, perhaps in retirement. If you've reached that milestone, there's a point where you say, is that the end of fruitful labour? Now all that's left to me is to travel around Australia, uh, care for grandkids, good things. Uh, But we feel like that's the end of God's labour for us. That's not true, is it? There's always another season of what God might have you engaged in. A friend of mine, a good friend of mine, um, says he's now in his third age. His third age. He was a professional, and then he became a children's minister at our church. And now, what I love now is he, he lives in this 20, uh, 20 story apartment block, and he's become the building manager. But I would rather call him the building chaplain because what he sees as his role there is just being amongst people and, and looking for opportunities to tell them about Jesus. Waiting patiently is not waiting passively. Waiting patiently is doing a, a pull and saying, I see that there's some fruitful labour yet. Maybe there's things I can do now that I was never free to do before. So, if you read verses 5 and 6 again, you might read them kind of with spiritual eyes. Perhaps this is the season to build the Lord's house, to plant seeds for God's kingdom, to raise up spiritual children, to be at peace with waiting, like the parable of the talents. The Lord returns and He'll say, I invested in you, what have you done with that? What did you do while you waited? But in verse 7 of our passage, it's not just about what the Jewish community might do amongst themselves in in labouring for each other and caring for each other and building up their homes. Verse 7 says also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city, that is Babylon. And that's a surprising thing, The, the Babylonians are the ones who wrenched them out of their homeland and took them into exile. And God says, seek the peace of this city. The word for peace, you might recognise, it's the word shalom in Hebrew. Shalom, the word for peace. It's more than just peace and quiet. It's that sense of I am where God has put me and there's, there's good things for me here, where God has put me in relationship with Him. Where I am is the right place right now. That's the peace that Jeremiah is talking about. And the message is he wants them in Babylon. God says, pray for Babylon, because in its peace is your peace. Now, in our version, it says prosper. If it prospers, you will prosper. But it's actually the shalom word there as well. If they're experiencing peace, you can experience peace there with them. It's not actually saying seek the prosperity of Babylon as if if they get rich, you'll get rich. God is just saying, no, for a little while, my plans for you and my plans for Babylon overlap. And you should make peace with that. I think some Christians really struggle with this because we feel we might want to be separate from the world. There's only bad stuff out there. 
There's only rebellion against God. There's only things that God's not happy with. And so we think maybe the best thing would be to be separate, to go Amish, to move to a monastery. But there's another, there's another stream of Christian thinking, and it's very ancient. In fact, it probably goes back to a guy named Augustine. Do you know about Augustine? He was Bishop of North Africa about 1,600 years ago. He wrote a book called The City of God, and it was really about Babylon versus Jerusalem, two overlapping cities. I think we've got a, a diagram for this. Uh, he talked about the city of the world and the city of God, Babylon and Jerusalem. Uh, and their ideas of peace actually overlap. So there's Babylon, Jerusalem, and we'll go one more slide. They have an idea of peace and we have an idea of peace. And Augustine said, you realise that actually we overlap in some things, not on everything, but in some things we actually agree what brings peace to human beings. We actually agree with the people of this world. They're made by the same creator. There is actually an overlap there where we might even work together work together on things that benefit people, that are good for people. And so, Augustine's idea was you don't have to withdraw and live in a monastery, you can live in the overlap. You can work for peace even in this world while you wait for heavenly peace. So, so here's some actual words of Augustine. He, he talks about the peace which is enjoyed by the people that are alienated from God and the use made of it by the people of God in their time of pilgrimage. He says, use the peace of Babylon, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for fruitful labour for the Lord. So, Augustine says, don't just withdraw to one side. No, he tells us to work in the overlap while we're in exile. And the first way to do that, he mentions, uh, sorry, Jeremiah mentions in verse 7 is, you pray. You pray for Babylon if you're there. Pray that it is a place where you might have an opportunity to serve the Lord. And Augustine actually points to our other reading today. He says, have a read of 1 Timothy 2. What does it say? Pray for kings and those in authority. Pray that there'll be peace so that we might live godly lives. Pray that we can be productive in the time we have. The reason I was in Nairobi Airport as I was telling you, was because I just taught a, a theology course to pastors in East Africa, and I was on my way home, and it turned out that Nairobi Airport, although there wasn't much to do, was actually very peaceful. People were very calm. It was amazing. And I sat there, and I was actually able to mark exams for eight hours. That may not be your idea of productivity, but it was wonderful to get back home and have most of my marking done. There was actually something I could do while I was waiting. Pray for peace, so you can use the peace, not just to build your own house. Yes, settle down, Jeremiah says, build a house, but not just that. In 1 Timothy 2, it's actually pray for peace so that people can find out about Jesus, so that we can spread the gospel. 1 Timothy 2 says God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth of Jesus. Are you praying for that? Not just the peace of your home, but are you praying that there might be a society where the news of Jesus spreads. We should be praying for our council elections in a couple of weeks. We should be praying for Kylie Wilkinson and David Coleman and government at all levels that they might promote peace. I, hope, I pray that you are praying against things that might constrain the spread of the gospel, whether that's unrest in society or certain laws that might restrict the spread of the gospel. Jeremiah is saying, use the peace of Babylon, pray for the peace of Babylon, that there might be an opportunity to serve the Lord. But there's something even more than that here. I'd say more than just using the peace of Babylon, Jeremiah encourages us to, to outdo the peace of Babylon. God sends His people to Babylon, not just as a punishment for their unfaithfulness, but as a witness to Babylon. Because you realise the Jewish exiles, they're experiencing their discipline from God, but Babylon haven't yet. God's warning Babylon as well by putting these people in their midst. It's like one Peter, I think we have this on a slide. Peter says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, so he, he pictures them as the Jews in exile. 
He says, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul and live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. What that's saying is, we're not just using the peace while we've got it, that's saying we actually can outdo this world and show them a different vision, a better version of peace, what God's peace looks like. Tim Keller has a book called Centre Church where he talks about that the role of Christians, especially in cities like Sydney, is where all these people are clustered in together, we can work and try and demonstrate what God's vision for peace might look like. I'm going to read you a little bit of Tim Keller here as well. He says, Christians are called to be an alternate city within every earthly city, an alternate human culture within every human culture, to show how sex, money, power can be used in non-destructive ways, to show how classes and races that can't get along outside Christ can get along in Him, and to show how it's possible to cultivate by using the tools of art, education, government and business to bring hope to people rather than despair or cynicism. And you know, the accusation of Christians too often, and you know this saying, is they're too heavenly minded to be of any earthly use. Well, Tim Keller's idea and Augustine's idea and Jeremiah's idea is, no, we can be of great use in our society and in the process show people that there's another sort of peace available beyond this world. So that's the the peace of Babylon. But I do want to also mention that there's a whole other kind of peace in this passage. From verses 10 to 14, there's the vision of Jerusalem, where these exiles want to be. This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah says, but in 70 years I will fulfill my promise to bring you back to this place. And that's a blow, 70 years. But when they return to Jerusalem, they will have peace. It's the city of peace. And so verse 11 says, this is a plan God has to prosper you in the end. And that's the shalom word again. This is a plan to give you peace in the end. And a better kind of peace. God's people finally in God's place under God's rule. That's God's promise all along to Abraham and Moses and David that God will bring his people to be blessed in the promised land, under Him. And of course, that's the plan of the book of Revelation. You see, in the end, there's a peaceful city, the new Jerusalem, God's people gathered at peace, finally. What's odd then, if that's that's what Jeremiah's talking about, if you've ever been to Kurong, or you've been to the Christian bookstore, there's always the wall of plaques. Have you seen the wall of plaques? There's, there's every household item with a Bible verse on it, and often, often it's Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, and it's this thing you put in your home as if God's got this plan in this life to bless you. Things are going to get better, that's not what Jeremiah is talking about. He's talking about Jerusalem, not Babylon, in verse 11. He's saying there is something coming that's so good, everything here will pale into comparison. So don't misread 29.11. That's kind of the classic prosperity gospel verse, the one that says what God wants is to make you wealthy, healthy here. That's his main goal. That's not his main goal. His goal is heaven. I hope you see then, this is a promise about Jerusalem, not Babylon, heaven, not earth. This is God saying, seek the peace of Babylon while you're here, but look forward to a much better life to come. It's like a a spiritual marshmallow test. I might call it the shalom test. Can Can you use the peace now, but remember there's something much better coming. Don't be so absorbed with the thing now that you lose sight of what's coming. The point of Jeremiah's letter for us this morning is to encourage us to accept a time in exile and then when the 70 years are up, Jeremiah's goal is, verses 12 to 14, that God's people are calling out to him, trusting him, looking forward to their return. They're ready to go back to Jerusalem. It's the shalom test. Can you make peace with waiting? 
When you do that, you kind of bring forward the peace of heaven. You start to experience it now, the peace of God which passes all understanding. That's the, the peace that you can experience even now while you're waiting. It's like you're on the plane and you've got the little map and there's your destination and it's inching towards the destination. But as you start to imagine where you're going, you start to, to enjoy the, the anticipation. Soon I'll be home. Soon I'll be with my family. I'll be getting off that plane and I'll be where I've longed to be. And you start to experience that peace. So friends, the, this letter actually has two halves. The first half is to stop people thinking so much about Jerusalem that they're unproductive in Babylon. The second half is to stop them thinking so much about Babylon that they lose their sight of going back to Jerusalem. If the first half is the parable of the talents, the second half is the parable of the ten virgins. Do you know that one? The ten ladies who are waiting for their master's return, but five of them get distracted and they, they don't have any oil for their lamps, and so their lamps go out and they're not ready when the master returns. Jeremiah is saying, don't let that lantern go out while you're waiting. So to finish, I think the way you get the, the balance of this letter right is to picture it. So I'll bring back our, our little diagram, is to picture it. Babylon and Jerusalem, two cities, two types of peace, worldly peace, heavenly peace, and they overlap. And that's the experience of those Jewish exiles in Babylon, but that's also the experience of a Christian person living on earth in hope of heaven. And the message of this letter is live in the overlap. That's where you should be. That's where God wants you to be right now. Waiting is hard, but live with that tension. Put on both the home and away jerseys at the same time because this is where God has put you. Can you make peace with that? That's the shalom test of Jeremiah 29. We're going to sing one more song and then we'll conclude our service. Please stand as we sing together. Amen.
Please take a seat. We have come to the end of our service. There are a few quick announcements, um, so I'll get the first one up. Um, next week is Father's Day. It has come very quickly, and we're just going to show you a quick little video of what we did last year and what you can expect next week. a father or you have a father, bring them along and um, join in in the fun after um, the service. Oh, kids do need to bring their own Nerf and bullets and um, any protection if they need it, if the fathers need it. Um, we also have a working bee coming up on the 14th of September, but for now I'm going to hand over to Sophie and she's going to give a quick update. Hi, my name's Sophie, I'm on Parish Council and we had our monthly meeting this last week. If you'd ever like to raise um, any sort of issue with Parish Council, if you look in the hall outside, there's a board with all of the faces and names of people on it and an email address. Things that we talked about this um, last week, so our giving remains flat and we are slightly below budget, so that is something um, for us to be aware of and keep in our prayers and, as well. If you have a first aid qualification, we're looking to put together a list of names um, of people who have that so that if there is an incident, we can go to you um, while we're also contacting appropriate um, other people. Um, so please see Ben Pringle if you have that um, qualification. There are new signs installed in the car park outside which say church parking and they're really well installed, they look great and it's just a way to help keep the car park available for people who need it when they need it. Now if you are someone who gets our roster, you might have seen there's a new um, category on the roster and it says host. Um, that is not the service leader and it's not anything else, what it is, is people from parish council who are doing open up and lock up at the beginning and end of the service. So just for your own information, if you hear the word host or see it on the roster, just so you know what that means, it is parish council going around locking things up after the service. Thanks everyone. Thanks Sophie. So today we heard that waiting is hard, but if you are a follower of a follower of Christ, God promises a peace that is to come. And at the moment, we live in the overlap. So let me read Philippians 4, 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you for coming today. Uh, please join us for morning tea in the hall, coffee on the veranda. And um, yeah, please uh, continue our fellowship this morning. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>